everybody. Thanks for coming to this uh, plenary parallel session on uh, energy challenges in transport. Um, so my name is Anna Creti, and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, and to keep the, uh, the discussion lively uh, around this uh, idea of the challenges. So which are the challenges that we are going to discuss? So just to, to give some figures uh, and to introduce the, um, uh, the topic that will be debated. Um, let's see some figures uh, about which is the link. So the first one is the consumption. That is how uh, much uh, not only we depend on transport, but how much of energy uh, is, con is consumed by transport. And uh, even though those figures refer to a few years ago, so 2015, according to the latest uh, uh, statistics available from uh, the EU, so just uh, looking at the local situation, we can see that transport uh, accounts for 33% of the total final energy consumption. Uh, it is second to house and uh, it comes before industry. Um, I was a little bit surprised. I, I was uh, um, thinking that the role of transportation was uh, uh, a little bit uh, behind the industry, but I mean, the, and you can also see the importance of road uh, consumption, of course, something that we are going also to address today uh, within the final energy, energy consumption. Um, so this is to set the skin, and uh, of course, one of the problems that we have is how to reduce energy consumption in transportation, not necessarily per se, but because this is one of the uh, challenges that we have to face if you want to decarbonize the sector, and exactly Exactly one of the uh, uh, possibility is to use biofuels. Um, so I think that um, this is another topic that deserves attention. Uh, even I mean, the definition of categories of uh, biogasol and biodiesel, what it is, which are the um, uh, production processes, uh, which uh, uh, raw materials they are using, and how do we manage uh, to, uh, to get these alternative fuels, is a question that we are going to address. Um, so the, the problem is, of course, to take all greenhouse gases emissions from transportation. Uh, and we see that despite all the measures that have been introduced, um, just looking at the dynamics of greenhouse gases emissions, of which we have CO2 and uh, the other gases, uh, is stagnating. So uh, looking at the difference between 90 and 2015, uh, it is increasing quite steadily, but still increasing. Um, and finally, uh, one, another way to decarbonize this sector is, of course, to use electric vehicles. Um, here you can see uh, the uh, market share of electric vehicles in, in Europe, and since we are in the Netherlands, uh, of course, we, we have seen and coming here uh, a lot of uh, bicycles, but they have, compared to other countries, also the uh, highest share of electric vehicles. Um, and if you, um, well, one of the questions that you are just looking at the figure is why do we have this ups and down? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, if you just look for the years at which you have the peak and the trough, they correspond to uh, difference in schemes of the subsidies that have been adopted. Uh, so this is one also of the question is uh, behind this uh, greening of the transportation sector. It is the same problem that we have with renewables in the electricity sector. Of course, we still need some support schemes uh, in order to uh, uh, give incentive to people to change their behavior. And in particular, we're going to see that electric vehicles, uh, in terms of uh, um, increase of their market share, they offer an interesting example, but still they are quite low comparing to the traditional uh, vehicles. Um, so we are going, we have the privilege to discuss this topic with uh, three uh, very interesting speakers. Um, they are going to provide insights on different topics, so starting from the right, uh, Steph. Um, oh, there's also a... <laughs> so who is Mats, who is Steph? <laughs> Steph, <laughs> he, 
is going to, um, he, he works on regulation markets and transportation economics, he's going to talk about uh, the oil uh, importance, so the traditional, the, or what is happening in the traditional um, sector and uh, whether we can get rid of oil in transportation. Mad, so on the opposite, <laughs> he works on climate agreement, climate policy and uh, technological change. Steph and Mans, they also work together. Maybe that is why I was confused. <laughs> and uh, in the middle, uh, Yannick, uh, he, uh, he's an expert about electric vehicles. Um, and uh, just to fix a few ideas that uh, will be discussed, um, so as I pre-announced, we will have, uh, we will start from the traditional industry. So I suggest that Steph is going to set the scheme uh, whether we can phase out uh, by using an important instrument to decarbonize not only the transportation sector but the overall economy, that is carbon taxes, knowing that we, in this specific sector we have an additional instrument, which is the fuel tax. Um, and then if we um, are able to meet this challenge, we also have, uh, so which is the substitution possible, this is the case for biofuel, in transportation, and here we will uh, discuss the issue of first, second generation and all the regulation that is uh, around the biofuel sector, uh, and to end up with uh, electromobility. Uh, in, in this case, Yannick is going to discuss also not only the uh, development of the sector, but also which are the contractual arrangements that make uh, it possible some complementarities between electric vehicles and electricity markets. So it's up to you. Can I use this? <laughs> Much taller than me, oh. so we okay. need to adapt. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I need an engineer to help me. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. Okay, um, now it's still the presentation. Thank you for this opportunity to present some views on uh, use of energy and transportation. Uh, I myself struggling with this problem probably since 1995, where at some point a uh, European Commission asked me to look at the case for a five liter car uh, in uh, 2005. And I said, I didn't think it's a good idea because cars are already, the use of fuel in cars is already heavily taxed. So uh, I think there is no need to do that. Now, I think this story has been going on. Uh, I think we are now uh, 20 or more than 20, 20 years later. And uh, I think there's still an interesting question to be looked at. Um, no, in the meantime, we look for the right slides. Uh, but, okay, that's, it's a matter. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I don't need the paper, so that's fine. No. Uh, how do you go for Is that let me see small problem it's still that's a title but okay I can maybe stay here <laughs> And now, let me try to control. Okay, so thank you. So this is the outline, thank you. So what I would like to do is just uh, come back to a few, uh, I think, important data before we can start any discussion. And what is important in these data is, uh, I just give you the main issues. Thank you. I, don't, I will have to. No, I can stay here. Oh, thank you, Bert. <laughs> uh, so 
transport sector is really important. It's an important customer of the oil industry. Let's say it's 50% or more than 50% soon will be used by uh, transportation. Uh, this transport activity is growing very fast, uh, mainly outside the OECD. And the highest growth in exactly these sectors that are rather oil intensive. These are aviation, uh, shipping, and uh, car use. Then we'll come back to some economics. Uh, of course, there's a lot of economics uh, behind the data. And, and uh, so the main stories I will try to convey is about road taxes and carbon taxes. Uh, a lot of people say that we need to add some uh, uh, carbon taxes to, uh, to the use of, of a car, while actually the gasoline taxes are pure carbon taxes. Okay? And then discuss international climate agreements. And these are the two main issues, I think, whenever we start to discuss about the future of uh, oil in transportation. Uh, okay, so I think mine works. Thank you very much. So again, this is a small slide for the EU where you see that road transportation is uh, the main uh, emitter of CO2. And then you have maritime, aviation, rail is two times nothing. Auto transport is also not important. Okay. Now, what is really at stake is this is a, a figure taken from the BP outlook. Uh, because if you look at many outlo other outlooks by international organizations, they would like to have some things. And of course, it's difficult to say this is our policy that we would like to phase out oil by 2050. Then, of course, in the official slides or in the forecast, you need to have that result. Well, I think in that sense, uh, some of the, uh, I prefer some of the slides of the oil industry that tell us that, okay, what do they think, uh, what uh, would be their market uh, forecast or market uh, prospects? What you see is that uh, what is driving here is the vehicle fleet. Of course, if people get richer out of the OECD, uh, of course, whenever, let's start with OECD, whenever you have, let's say, uh, vehicles, uh, 600 vehicles per thousand uh, inhabitants. It's difficult to go for more cars. And anyway, if you have more cars, they will not be used so intensively. Uh, but uh, if you look at cases like China, India, there is still, uh, if they also want the same car ownership as OECD countries, then there is an enormous margin of growth. And that's what you will see in the transport demand in terms of billion uh, of tons of oil equivalent. Uh, so the main growth will come uh, outside of the uh, OECD. Uh, this growth is actually coming from passenger transportation. And in passenger transportation, uh, you see here actually the bottom is the uh, OECD. This is the non-OECD, and that's actually the growing factor. Uh, in terms of volumes, so these are data coming from the International Transport Forum, OECD, uh, part of the OECD. And then you see high growth in aviation. So, uh, okay. We can also move to freight transportation. In freight transportation, uh, you see the green. So again, we have the OECD. We have the non-OECD over here. And then we have here aviation. Uh, sorry, not aviation, it's uh, international shipping. International shipping and aviation are special sectors because they are, because of uh, some kind of fuel uh, competition, they are some kind of international, they are not associated to any country. It's clear that if you believe in, uh, growth, in a lot of growth in, uh, outside of the OECD and also between OECD and non-OECD, it's clear that international shipping, uh, China, East Asia, whatever, uh, Africa, uh, there is a high growth volume. What does it mean in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions? You see that uh, despite many efforts, despite... Um, yeah, so, <laughs> Despite many efforts, uh, we see that by 2050, thank you, uh, we will still have 60% more emissions in some kind of business as usual. If we expect, let's say, the normal expectations given the present regulations, given what uh, many people think that uh, there are some good willing actions on all sides, we still have plus 60%. Okay. Let me... Uh, add some economics uh, and start with road taxes and carbon taxes. Uh, 
Let me start with conventional pollution. Conventional pollution, I think, is something we are getting aware of that it is pretty important. Um, I think we are getting better fossil fuel engines, also better, uh, better fuels. Um, I think in the sense, in, in, I think the gasoline cars are here really winning in the sense that if you look at the conventional pollution for NOx and uh, particulates from, let's say, a car from the 90s and a current car, uh, there's not too much heating. Uh, I think, and you will have reduction maybe by factor 10. For the diesel cars, it's different. Uh, the diesel cars is actually, uh, we really made a mistake in Europe. We thought it was a technology that gives us a small advantage in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that uh, actually could, in theory, maybe true. But in practice, uh, I think, uh, in terms of conventional pollution, they do five times uh, worse than a gasoline car. So it's really probably something that will be phased out sooner or later for cars. Now, uh, we know that for greenhouse gas emissions, it's a worldwide uh, pollutant. It doesn't matter whether it's coming from industry or from car. So as an economist, you try to do it in the cheapest way. And the cheapest way is to have a common tradable permit system or a common carbon tax. Now, what many people do not always realize, and it's difficult to explain to some politicians, is that although the cars have not a carbon tax, but they have a high gasoline tax, that it acts as a carbon tax. And this carbon tax is, is uh, very important, so if you want to have an idea, so this is for the average, for the whole of the OECD, including the US that has pretty low taxes, so this is the tax rate in euro per ton of CO2. These are data from OECD. Um, you see we are here at uh, 85. I think in uh, Europe it's more like uh, 200 or 300 euro per ton of carbon. And if you compare it to many other sectors, this, uh, this also includes the price of ETS, the price of carbon uh, permits. Okay. Uh, we see there's an enormous uh, difference between sectors. And this normally implies that in terms of cost efficiency, the, the car transportation is not the sector that we should focus on. So for the moment, the gasoline tax serves mainly to control for pollution, for pollution a little bit, but mainly to control for the level of congestion. And we should be aware that a very fuel efficient car, the more uh, fuel efficient is the car, with a given carbon rate, carbon tax rate, we just will have more congestion. Because the effective tax per kilometer will go down. Okay. A second issue that is important is that we are dealing with the world. Okay, I'm from the EU, Belgium, very small country. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, carbon emissions of Europe in the longer term, maybe with something like 10% or less. So, uh, it's clear that we need a good, biting, a really effective international agreement. Um, now, what is the problem with international agreement? It's typical, some kind of prisoner's dilemma. And uh, so we have had agreements, Kyoto, Paris, December, 19, uh, December 2015. They do not deliver. Maybe there are a lot of promises, a lot of pledges, but I think most economists to be honest, I think they do not believe that they will deliver what is promised. Uh, but why? Because there is no sanction. I know that our more recent uh, contributions, for instance, by Nordhaus, uh, thinking about uh, some kind of, kind of trade mechanism, trade sanctions. But uh, in the current era, I think of uh, Trump, etc., making a new trade agreement that will punish people for not uh, complying with uh, agreements on, on a common, for instance, uh, carbon tax is actually also very difficult. Now, this has uh, important implications. The implication is that whenever you have unilateral efforts, good willing countries that uh, want to do something for different reasons, okay, um, whenever they reduce their oil demand, okay, and if the other countries are not so much concern, concerned about reducing their oil demand, there will be a reaction on the world oil markets. And the reaction on the world oil markets will be that prices now 
will go down and that they will try to sell their stock of oil as long as the, the stock of oil is really cheap to uh, extract. They will try to do it anyway. Okay. So it could be that whenever we reduce our consumption of oil in cars in the EU, it could be, or in Japan, or in China, it could be that in the end uh, it has uh, only very limited effect. Where do we go? Let me try to conclude with two slides. Car technology is, of course, developing uh, rapidly. As we see all kinds of new uh, technologies appearing. Um, we have in the EU and Japan still very high gasoline prices, strict emission standards, uh, and they force car manufacturers to make sure that the car they offer on the market, not only the European manufacturers, but also the uh, the other manufacturers, including the Chinese and the Americans, if, they, if you want to sell a car in Europe, you better make sure that is a five-liter car by 2021. Okay. So I think there is some kind of positive uh, spillover in terms of technology. Um, so I think that's an important fact. And there's also the important fact that you see in the fact that OECD uh, emissions are slightly going down over time there will be also some spillover to uh, the rest of the world. Now, um, I think that progressively road pricing will substitute uh, high fuel excises. And certainly if you have electric cars coming into the system, uh, electric cars, driving an electric car is extremely cheap whenever you have the car. Because electricity costs almost nothing compared to a highly taxed fuel. So what will happen is that the countries to protect their tax base, excise tax base, they will have to move to other taxation systems. So sooner or later, because we have more and more congestion, or because the tax base is, tax base is, uh, is threatened, we will move to another taxation system for cars and for trucks. And so this will mean that in the end, we will have lower tax, uh, taxes on uh, gasoline and diesel. Uh, so what do I expect is that when electric cars are fueled by renewable energy, okay, or half by renewable energy is also good for me, can compete with gasoline cars that pay the extraction cost plus something like a $30 per ton of CO2 gasoline tax rather than the $200 or more tax now. I think then the remaining oil will not be sold in the, in the, in the, uh, in the transport sector. It will be left in the ground. Okay. Second point, there are not only cars, there's also trucks and aviation. For trucks, things are a little bit more difficult. It's difficult to have uh, electric propulsion by trucks, for trucks. So, of course, you can think about natural gas, biofuels, hydrogen. Uh, don't forget that diesel also has already a high carbon tax. So they will be much slower to shift to uh, carbon-free fuels. Aviation, it's a bit the same story. Maritime transport is probably easier because there's not so much the weight uh, problem. Uh, so maritime transport you can substitute more easily. Uh, both sectors are in fact not taxed at all for the moment. There's a small ETS. Uh, let's say they make, in Europe they are part of the ETS. They will be, probably these sectors will be the last to substitute. Okay, summing up, I think substituting fossil fuels uh, will be a very slow process for different reasons. Uh, climate change economics tells us that there are cheaper options to reduce uh, greenhouse gases, number one. Second one is that the oil exporters will protect their rents and make sure they sell their oil reserves anyway uh, by decreasing prices whenever electric cars become really competitive and substituting fuel use in trucks and air transportation will be even slower because it just technically it's more costly to do. Thank you. Yeah, I think Bert will help us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Skriker. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to talk about biofuels. Of course, biofuels has been motivated, it can still be motivated. It's supported in several countries and could be motivated of several reasons. 
uh, not only climate change and the need to reduce emissions, it could also be energy security, you want to have uh, fuels for transport from your own country, or it could be uh, developing agriculture into new areas, etc. But the focus of this talk will be biofuels in transport. And I will talk a lot about EU as well, but of course, uh, both in the US and in other countries like Brazil, they have a very proactive biofuels policy. So biofuels to me was like, a, it was a very sweet dream in the beginning. It's like this, this figure here, that you, that you have, uh, this works, yes. You have plants growing, taking up CO2 from the atmosphere. You cut the plants, you harvest the plants, you put it into a factory and you get fuel. And then you emit the CO2 again. But this is just a, a very nice circle and the CO2 is then taken back into the plants and you don't have any extra emissions. So that was the sweet dream, I think, uh, for several of us, uh, like 10 years ago or so, or maybe more, that this could really help to do something with, uh, with the climate. But then it's not as simple as this, uh, as I will show you. It's not like this very simple circuit. It's much more complicated. So I think something had happened and for a lot of people this uh, sweet dream has turned pretty sour that's at least my my uh, my proposal <clears throat> okay why biofuels in transport uh, as steph has already showed transport is important for total emissions and uh, transport consists of a lot of road traffic and as far as i can see the the EU has, in a way, tied its hands to do something to reduce emissions in transport pretty fast, all, already within 2030. Because the EU has promised in the Paris Agreement, has set very ambitious targets, 40% reduction of emissions from the 1990 levels, and then, uh, and that's not, and they have set even more targets because they have split their targets on the ETS sectors and the non-ETS sectors. So we have a separate target for the non-ETS sector, and that's a 30% reduction for the EU as a whole compared to 2005 levels. And then if you're going to reach that target within 2030, you have to do something with transport because transport make up the lion's share of all emissions in the, in the, um, uh, in the non-ETS sectors. And of course, for some of the EU countries, the rich EU countries, this, this, this target is even tougher. It's like 40% reduction within 2005. And you will have some kind of trading market between uh, countries for non-ETS emissions, but this institution is not yet established. So you sort of, you have to do something to get, to get emissions down. And then you have to note that within 2030, electrifying transport, that, that's a re really long process, as Steph was talking about, and I will show you a figure later. It will take time. The, the, the advantage with biofuels is they, they you can do it, you can uh, mix biofuels into the gasoline, and you, you don't have to exchange the capital stock, at least up to some level, blending uh, ceiling, and you can get immediate emission reduction, at least in theory. And of course, also, uh, electrification is likely not practical for all modes. So there is, there is a need here to use biofuels if you want to reach this target. Just to show you this easy computation that I made before I, I went here, I, I wrote the title is Confessions from an EV Patriot because most of my research is on EVs and I've always been very patriotic about EVs. But you have to, you have to really understand that it takes a really long time, even if EV is a success. It takes a long time for EV to take over the market. So here in this figure, I have this blue line here. It's the market share of EVs that you observe in sales. But of course, the stock of cars, it's the stock of cars that determines the emissions, not the how much EVs you sell every year. It's the stock of cars that makes up the emissions. That's the cars they are used. And even if you have a real success in EVs, so this is the share of EV car sales, in 2018, as you saw, it was really low in the EU, not in Norway, then it's 30% sales in Norway of all cars. So let's say you have a success, so already in 2030, you have a 50% of all cars that are sold are EVs. Still, EVs will not make more up more than 10% or something of the car stock. Uh, 
And of course, if you only have 10% of EVs, then you have 90% of gasoline cars, and they will emit a lot, and it will be very hard to reach the 2030 target. So that's, that's one argument for bio biofuels. And this is a very simple model. A car lasts for 20 or 15 years. It uh, make, doesn't make a big difference. And uh, yeah, so it's hard to get a higher share of EVs, and then you have to do something else. You have to look to, to biofuels. And also, if you, I said that the biofuels dream had turned sour and people are not interested in biofuels. But if you look to these um, projections or scenarios for how we should reach the two degree target, biofuels has a prominent role. I think that's also important to note. Uh, for instance, in the IAA uh, technology roadmap from 2017, uh, <coughs> biofuels provides 10% of the energy in transport by 2030. And this continues to grow. So it's not a very intermediate solution just for 2030. It's 27% by 2050. Also in the IPCC, uh, latest uh, report on mitigation, uh, they, have, they have a separate appendix about biofuels reflecting that this is complicated. But still, they think that all these problems with biofuels can be solved. And then they say it has a conditional, very significant contribution all the way to 2100, both in transport and in energy production and in industry. But both these reports stresses the need to distinguish between different first generation biofuels, I'll come back to this difference, but still use first generation and to speed development of second generation biofuels. So first generation biofuels, that's, that's biofuels made from things that you also could eat, made from soy, made from uh, sugar cane, made from uh, corn, etc. And uh, it has become clear that not all these kinds of biofuels really provides a reduction in GHG emissions. They may, may provide energy security, they may provide a new profitable opportunity for agriculture, but they don't provide GHG emission reductions. So some of it you should clearly avoid. But then it's also this uh, argument that it competes with food production. And then by definition for some people, then it's not good. You should use all that you grow for food and not uh, for fuel. And then I was looking at some old figures and then I was thinking like 400 years ago, at least in Norway, horses ate 15% of all the agricultural production just to keep up the agricultural production. To, to plow, etc. And no one thought that was particularly wrong, at least not in principle. And of course, food security, that's not only about not using biofuels, it's uh, about intensification of land use and also changing diets, a lot of possibilities. So I think first generation is not in principle wrong, but it's more about choosing the right types, as I will come back to. And it's also about having the right alternative costs. So people want food, and that will actually make uh, uh, biofuels from uh, first generation very costly if you want to have a lot of it, because there is a competition for this land that is, can be used to grow food on. So it, I think it's more like a question of cost when there are multiple alternative uses of land. And then to advance biofuels. That biofuels are made from, uh, from crops that you cannot eat or made from residuals from crops like corn stover, for instance, which I have a picture of here. So this is a corn plant and this is the stover, all these things here. You don't eat it, but you can actually make biofuels from it. And if you make biofuels from this, it's, uh, of course, uh, not taking the food out of the mouth of anyone, uh, uh, and, uh, but it's more complicated. So I think that has been the sort of the, 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 the saving of biofuels. So we use different feedstock. You can use waste, you can use wood residues, corn stover, as I mentioned, and something that uh, when I wrote a paper in 2014 about biofuels, I was really interested in, that was switchgrass. It's a type of grass that grow on the prairie. And actually, if you start to harvest it, it will actually increase the carbon, uh, carbon uh, content of the, of, the, of the fields where it grows. So it has a very positive effect on, uh, on redu reducing GHG emissions. So also talk about algae. There are also a lot of different pathways. If you have these feedstocks, you can produce biofuels from them in a 
a lot of different ways. This is an old, old way where you just uh, combine the, the carbon with the water uh, vapor and you can get, uh, get uh, then uh, different types of fuel, the fischer trops process. And then you have a lot of other processes, transesterification, thermochemical, gasification, biochemical, enzymatic process, etc. And all these processes are in use, but some are more ripe than others. This is a really ripe process because it has been in use for a long, long time. This is a very new process where you could have a lot of learning still and a lot of cost uh, improvements. Uh, but IA, uh, IA thinks that these advanced biofuels will be very important. And here you see some projections. Uh, this is the 2000 and uh, uh, this is 2025. And this is in order to reach the two degree target. And this is how much advanced biodiesel you should have. This is so, how much advanced bioethanol you should have. And this is how much you should have a first generation biodiesel uh, and, and ethanol. But as you can see, we are far away from that target now. In 2020, they project that there will be only this very, very tiny strip up here of the advanced biofuels. So this advanced biofuels is, looks very interesting, has a lot of good ideas, but it's not taking off, definitely. It's coming very slowly on. And why is that? And I, I still, clearly, the costs are still prohibitively high. It's, 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 uh, it's a lot of cost in, all the, in the whole value chain. Just collecting all this material is costly to, to bring it to the, to the factory. And I, I've been wondering, there are so many different processes, there are so many different feedstocks. Can we really rely on the market to choose the process here with the, most, uh, 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 with the highest potential uh, for the future? I mean the potential to reduce costs so that you get the competitive advanced biofuels. That's something I wonder about. And then to GHG, GHG emissions from biofuels, because that's, uh, that's really complicated. You have some really ugly biofuels that has a lot of GHG emissions and you have some good ones. Uh, so, emissions come from four sources, uh, simplified. You use inputs when you grow energy crops, for instance, fertilizer, and that can lead to nitrogen oxide emissions, which is a cli powerful climate gas. Uh, some has focused on using fossil energy for harvesting, transporting, and processing, and that's clearly important for corn, where you use a lot of fossil fuel from coal power plants to process the, the corn. And if you include that in the, in the carbon footprint of, bio, of corn bioethanol, then it turns out really bad. And then you have direct land use change. So if you have a virgin uh, field and you plow it and start to grow, then some of the carbon in the, in the soil will be released. And you get what is called a carbon depth. It takes some time before you actually re can, uh, when you replace fossil fuel, it takes several years before this carbon that's released when you start uh, to, to plow this virgin fuel, that you actually save this amount of carbon again by using fossil fuels. And then you have this even more complicated concept of indirect land use change. And that's when existing agricultural land is used for biofuels. So, they get, so you get less land for agricultural food production. And then you can speculate or hypothesize that new virgin land is cleared elsewhere for producing the food that you need. And then you will have a carbon depth from that kind of land. So all these are sources and you try to calculate these sources. The EPA has tried to do that. So this is the Environmental Protection Agency from the US. And they have then tried to calculate life cycle GHG emissions for selected pathways. And as you can see, there are some really ugly ones. That's corn, ethanol, and if you use a cert certain process using a lot of energy called wet mill coal, so they use a lot of fossil energy here, and then they actually increase emissions by 19%. So you, if you exchange fossil fuels like gasoline or diesel with this uh, corn starch ethanol from a wet mill coal, you will actually have more emissions than you had before. So percent reduction for petroleum gasoline, that's set to zero, of course, and you use fossils for all of it. And here they have looked at different uh, stuffs, and according to the EPA, corn store is very good. So you have to follow a certain process. It's, you produce ethanol from a biochemical enzymatic process, and then you actually increase 
the, you increase the carbon in the ground by some reason, I'm not sure why, because this is land use change. Uh, and you also use the material in itself to provide all the energy and you get excess energy so you can actually replace coal power in the power market, for instance, and then you get more than 100% reduction according to them. Also the same with switchgrass, you can have the same kind of uh, uh, very potent biofuels, if this is correct. So you see there is a lot of different biofuels with a lot of different GHG footprints and you have to really navigate through this. And the EU has tried to do that, uh, so they have a biofuels policy. Uh, they had a renewable energy target for transport, they still have, for 2020 it's 10%. Uh, for 2030, I don't think they have a, have a target for transport. Uh, and the biofuels policy is uh, it's not so clear any longer as it used to be. But in order to reach this 10% target in 2020, all biofuels that count for this target have to fulfill a sustainability certification or criteria. So you have to have, at, by 2018, you have to have at least 50% reduction of GHG savings, calculated much in the same way, but maybe a little bit different from what we saw on the EPA. And you're not allowed to use any fields that are converted wetland or forest and uh, you're not allowed to use feedstock from high biodiversity land. Of course, this is, in theory, this is very good because you want to select the right kind of biofuels and you want to reduce emissions and you, you reduce emissions if you succeed in doing this. But I wonder, do the certification institution really work? And I think that's something that we should do research on. Now, the certification institution has been around for some years. I've done some theory work myself on how it should be designed. But, uh, but I would really like to do some empirical work on how this certification works for biofuels. Because, for instance, there is something called shuffling. And that is, let's say you have a nice palm uh, oil plant hash, and you use this palm oil for uh, food. So you sell it to food producers. And then EU starts to have their uh, biofuels target and the sustainability criteria. And then you start to sell these biofuels that you used to sell for food to the biofuels in the EU, but this is an old palm oil plantage, so it's no converting of wetland and forest, it's no high biodiversity land. This palm oil plantage has been around for uh, a lot of years, so that's no problem. But you still want to, to, to supply the market for food, and then you just uh, cut down some tropical forest and supply the market for food from that, because in the market for food, there is no certification, and you get this shuffling problem. It's a theoretical possibility, but I think in this research topic, you should also look, is this shuffling a big problem or is it just something that, you, that might happen, which is not so widespread? That's important. Okay, I thought I should end. If I have some time left, I'll look at, yeah, I have some time left, with a paper that I wrote some years ago, looking at, the, at this topic. So it's, uh, it was published in the Journal of uh, the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists the American Journal, with uh, Michael Hull and Knut Anna Rosendahl. Uh, and our research questions were, will a global renewable fuel standard, that's actually what the EU has, they say that we have to have 10%, but that's renewable energy in, uh, in transport, and the US has also a renewable uh, fuel standard for, uh, for transport. And you, you, you just demand that you have a blending mandate, for instance, for biofuels, you say, all gasoline and diesel that is sold has to have, for instance, 10% uh, biofuels in it. So will such a policy instrument, uh, which targets biofuels, like in the US and partly in the EU, will that actually reduce climate costs? Uh, so is that good or bad? And uh, if we have these different biofuels, how much GHG emissions from biofuels can we actually accept? Is 50% good, for, isn't, for instance, as they had in the uh, EU sustainability criteria? And also we look more broadly on the market and welfare effects on the renewable fuel standard. And we also look at this topic that uh, Steph raised in the end of his presentation, that not all countries or regions have a renewable fuel standard. So we also look at what if only a subset of countries implement this renewable fuel standard. Uh, and we have a very simplified model here. It's, it's more like 
to understand the different mechanisms in this. So we explicitly model the market for oil, and we model it in a hoteling model. So oil is a non-renewable resource. Uh, in this model of ours, there is zero extraction cost in the theory. In the numerical model, we have a positive extraction cost. But the extraction cost is always lower than the price of bio biofuels, the alternative. So all oil resource will eventually be extracted, extracted in this model. That's a simplification. We can also solve it for a rising uh, extraction cost, and, that, and then not all will be extracted depending on the policy. But this is sort of taking it, taking it, making it as, as worst as possible for biofuels, because even if you have a biofuels policy, all oil will be extracted in this model. So this is taking the most bad uh, assumptions for biofuels. And uh, producers choose the optimal extraction path given the condition that um, the, the price minus the extraction cost, so this uh, resource rent should increase by the rate of return, as in the hoteling model. So that, that's a condition we put on the model, that it follows this hoteling rule. Uh, as I already said, biofuels are more expensive to produce than oil. Oil and biofuels are perfect substitutes uh, for the consumer. It doesn't matter what you use. You can drive as you, as you, as you, as you want with both. Uh, and when you have a blending uh, man mandate, you actually create a new type of fuel, which we just call transport fuel, which is a, a, a certain amount of biofuels and a certain amount of petroleum. And, and the price of this fuel is just a weighted average of the price on oil and the price on biofuels. And the price of oil comes from uh, the optimal extraction path and the, the rule that the price minus cost should be increased by the rate of return. Uh, and the price of biofuels is just equal to the production cost of biofuels, which is, uh, which is given in the model. And what is also new in this paper, and which I think is very important, and I, I miss really in the biofuels literature, is that you, you don't look only at carbon depth. Carbon depth is a very uh, simple uh, and easy uh, communi communicative uh, concept, but it doesn't really tell you whether a policy is good or bad. Because carbon depth just tells you, yeah, you have to use biofuels for 20 years before you start to reduce emissions. But here, instead of using this concept, we try to calculate discounted climate costs at every point in time. So what we, we have a cost of emissions. We put a price on emissions. Just it costs so and so much per ton. And then what you do with biofuels is to change the path of emissions. And then you can calculate if climate costs are reduced or not reduced. Uh, not looking in uh, just at carbon debt, but also calculate, but also taking into account that emissions at different point in time have a different costs. And, uh, and you, you would like to see if the total climate cost goes down or up if you have a biofuels policy. Uh, and uh, so it's more like an integrated assessment model. And we have, a, we have a concept for the stock of CO2 in the atmosphere. So there's actually in our model, there's nearly no depreciation of CO2. Uh, marginal social cost of carbon increases over time, but with a lower rate than the discount rate, which is normal in this kind of models. And this makes it uh, desirable to postpone CO2 emissions in principle. Okay, the general results. A global renewable fuel standard leads to a lower price on oil. Uh, so that benefits all oil importers uh, and lower resource rent. <coughs> it's a lower extraction in Italy, but higher later since you extract all oil in all scenarios. All oil is so you actually you 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 change the extraction path and put more later. And total use of transport fuel is reduced in Italy, and that's just because this new transport fuel that you create is more costly than just gasoline when you introduce the RFS. Uh, and if we just do it regionally, we have much of the same effects. Increased use of oil in the rest of the world, however, lower total extraction anyhow. And uh, <clears throat> so all the effects are weaker, but they don't terminate. Uh, they are not reversed or they're not uh, totally wiped out. It's still that you have lower extraction in Italy uh, and that the total use of transport fuel is reduced even if we have this carbon leakage effect in this model. And a subsidy to biofuels is very bad, combined with the binding renewable fuel standard, because the only thing you do that, you implicitly 
uh, actually implicitly uh, subsidize gasoline as well. And that's really important for policymakers to, to remember that if you have a renewable fuel standard, so that all transport fuel that is sold has to be have, for instance, 10% biofuels, and you start to subsidize these biofuels in addition, and then you actually subsidize gasoline uh, usage as well. So this is really bad in the model, and you, and you have to be aware of that. So if you use this policy instrument, you shouldn't combine it with any other policy instrument, at least not for production of biofuels or use of biofuels. Okay, we have some numerical simulations based on IA prospects for future oil demand. Uh, biofuels twice as costly to produce as oil. Uh, and elasticity, social cost of carbon is uh, $50 at the beginning, increases with 2% per year, like uh, normal, uh, uh, and the discount rate is 4%. I'm soon finished. So how much emissions from biofuels can we accept for the climate costs to go down? Assume you blend biofuels in the range 10 to 20%. The, the, the surprising thing in this model was that, yeah, Biofuels only has to reduce emissions by 5%. So you could have really high emissions from biofuels, but still you, you reduce the climate costs. And that's because of the f you postpone the whole oil extraction. By forcing this blending, you make transport fuel more costly, and then it's like taxing, uh, taxing the greenhouse gas emissions. And then it doesn't matter so much whether biofuels has emissions, because you still get less transportation fuel, you get less fossil fuel use, so that's the uh, effect in the near term, and that benefits you. But of course, uh, the effect is much better if you can uh, restrict the use of biofuels with a higher emission reduction. Yeah. Uh, the optimal policy in the model is of course not to have a blending mandate. It's to have a GHG emission tax, so we solve for that as well. And on both oil and biofuels, it depends how large the tax should be on the biofuels, depends on the emission footprint of the biofuels. And there is no reason to subsidize because we have no technological development or learning in the model. Learning costs could have a reason to subsidize advanced biofuels, that you increase learning, but we don't include it in this model, so we should have no subsidies. But it's possible to have an RFS to give the same reduction in climate cost as the optimal GHG emission tax, but it has to be really high, 50% in this model. So the emission tax is much more efficient, but if it's impossible or political reasons to have a, an emission tax, it's not clearly not possible because you see it for gasoline, but in other sectors, yeah, then uh, RFS is something that could be work. Okay, to the conclusion, I think Biofuels cannot be written off. It's uh, important in the intermediate term, at least. Uh, but when you want to use it, you cannot. Uh, you, you have to be really careful when you select a policy. For, if you, for instance, have a blending mandate, you cannot combine that with a production subsidy or a production-related tax relief. Uh, because then you, you just ruin the whole uh, effect of the blending mandate. You subsidize uh, fossil fuels. Any biofuels policy, in addition, has, requires careful certification of the eligible biofuels because there are really some really bad biofuels and you don't want them. And then you really have to think through the certification scheme. Does it work according to plan? Is it possible to have such a scheme? Uh, and I think also that biofuels will always be pretty small if you don't succeed with these advanced biofuels because there is a competition for land and competition for uh, crops that can use for food which will make biofuels very expensive, first generation biofuels if you really expand it. So you need to have these advanced biofuels uh, and then you need uh, innovations and learning and how should the government go about to to promote that and that I think is a it's a an interesting question and then uh, yeah, are the incentives for developing advanced biofuels adequate today uh, and how do we put the incentives right so that the market uh, choose the right pathway for this kind of biofuels thank you
hope I will. But... No, it's not you, I guess. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, for this invitation to come here and to speak about electromobility challenges. Um, in fact, uh, my position is quite bizarre because uh, uh, I come to show you what we did in uh, in the chair I'm 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 running in Paris. So it's a bit bizarre because there is a lot of things that we are trying to make, but uh, we don't have a perfect solution for everything. So the presentation is about uh, what we try to do. So uh, I apologize for not being capable to uh, transform the whole planet yet. So uh, I will do it in the next uh, 100 century. But uh. So electric vehicles and electrical grids. Uh, just some basic definitions to start because uh, when we are dealing with that problem, uh, we are using vehicle to grid uh, as if it was something uh, clearly defined. And I think it's not exactly the case. So we have five levels of uh, vehicle to something. Uh, that I will call vehicle to X. And the first part is to deal with vehicle to uh, transmission grid. Uh, how a fleet of electric car could provide services to help transmission grids. Second layer is the vehicle to distribution grids. How can we help the management of local congestions, of etc., etc., at the level of the local grid? Then there is a level of uh, management which is at uh, the level of the buildings how a fleet of electric car could help this building to be efficiently managed. Then at the household level, how can I help one house or a couple of uh, dwellings to uh, be uh, uh, efficiently managed? And then the last level is, uh, do I want to be off grid and forget about grids and just live in the middle of nowhere with my PV panels, my electric car, my storage, etc. And this is vehicle to hell or vehicle to load. These five elements are uh, the landscape of uh, vehicle to X, and I will try to give you an understanding of uh, why we should use one or two or three or four or five of these options uh, when we are looking at electric vehicles on the one hand and potential services on the other hand. So the outline of the presentations, I will try to show you uh, it uh, through first the challenges, then the solution that can be provided by markets, coordination, then solution by contracts, if there is no market coordination, and then I will try to draw some conclusions. First, uh, the good news for uh, electromobility is the fact that the cells are booming. So it's easy to have a, a ramp up uh, very sharp when you are starting with a very low stock. So we are not very enthusiastic about the fact that it goes up, but at, at least it goes up. So uh, we are uh, roughly today uh, at the present time uh, at more than 3 million cars. Uh, being uh, electric or uh, uh, plug-in hybrid, so it's not so bad. Uh, it could be better, but at least it has started. There is a long list of innovation that did not start, so at least electromobility has started. Uh, we could think that 3 million is not a lot. There is a lot of debate to know if uh, 1 million, 2 million, 3 million is a good news or not, but at least it has started. Uh, why it is uh, working and why we think that it will uh, continue to work, it's because the um, EVs are enjoying a double very nice dynamic. First is cost reduction of the batteries, and second is uh, the increase in energy density per uh, space, which means that you could either uh, put more batteries in lower space uh, or put more batteries at a lower cost. And uh, the biggest problem with electric vehicle is the cost of the batteries. Uh, but as you could see from $1,000 uh, per kilowatt hour uh, in 2020, it expected to be 100. So a division by 10 in 10 to 12 years. 
So it has an impact on the design of the cars because here in 2008, the average size of the battery is 16 kilowatt hour, I mean 16,000 euros. And uh, today the average size of the battery in 2018 is 40 kilowatt hour. And we expect in 2020 that 